Hello, and thank you for listening to the History of World War II podcast, Episode 189, Roosevelt's Secret War Against Hitler. On February 17, 1941, the founder of Time, Inc., Henry R. Luce, wrote an essay in Life magazine. One sentence went, We are in the war. The irony is that Hitler knows it, and most Americans don't. Luce was trying to take his fellow citizens to a place they refused to go, inside their own heads. Yes, the majority of American citizens hated Hitler, felt sorry for Europe, and sympathized with China for its brutal treatment at the hands of the Japanese Empire. But they hated any action or law that would bring them closer to participating in the conflict even more. Simply, America's house was divided. The isolationists had plenty of support in Congress. But, on the other hand, many young men had already defied the laws of the land to help fight the oppressors, be they Franco's military in Spain or the soldiers of the Axis powers, by sneaking off and joining up in other countries. And President Franklin D. Roosevelt was doing all he could, in a passive way, to bring his constituents to his way of thinking that at some point the United States would have to enter the war, if only to make sure the Axis powers lost, and freedom of whatever kind reigned once again. But this would take patience, and it would take time. Changing the hearts and minds of a population normally does, unless accompanied by a cataclysmic event. And as that had not happened yet, the president had to focus on a long game. Two presidential terms would probably not be enough. In his State of the Union address in 1935, FDR said, Those nations which are dominated by the twin spirits of autocracy and aggression have reverted to the old belief in the law of the sword, or to the fantastic conception that they, and they alone, are chosen to fulfill a mission and that all the others among the billion and a half of human beings in this world must and shall learn from and be subject to them. As it was still 1935, President Roosevelt had to be asking himself, but what can I do? Protect the U.S. and its interests? Yes. But what beyond that? Lead by example? Again, yes. But what good would that do if two sides or really just one country, wanted to go to war. How do you stop that from happening without using force yourself? Over the next few years, the president, balancing all these moving parts in his head, believed he had come upon a solution. Aggressive non-belligerence. And he fleshed out this term in early 1939. The United States had many methods short of war, to right wrongs done by others, or rather to deal with the results of those who chose force over diplomacy. The United States would help assist those peoples or nations hurt by others. As for going further, the President of the United States was obligated to defend the country, by the Constitution no less. Yes, there were currently neutrality laws on the books, and supposedly the president had to go to Congress before sending troops into a conflict, not that he wanted to. Roosevelt genuinely seemed determined to keep the sons of America out of another European conflict. One world war had been enough. No, the only thing that would change his position of sending young American men to fight was if his country was directly attacked first. As the late 1930s went by, it seemed that a general war was indeed coming. It was just a matter of where and when. The who seemed rather obvious to London, Paris, and Washington. But when FDR looked across the Atlantic, the only Brit who seemed ready to resist was Winston Churchill. And the American president didn't think much of him personally or professionally. Though Churchill would not be made the first Lord of the Admiralty and placed on the War Cabinet until September of 39, he seemed the only one many would turn to in the event of war. Yet FDR 
ever the proud American, vividly remembered the day when Winston had snubbed him at a banquet during the Great War, and now the more powerful Roosevelt didn't like that the British Empire still treated the United States as less than equal when it came to international affairs. Yet the two men had some things in common. They both loved the sea and everything maritime. Though Roosevelt learned politics from Woodrow Wilson, he was a more practical man. War was coming, but what would be the position of the United States? Politically, saying anything other than, I want to stay out, was suicide. And in late 1939, Roosevelt was considering the idea of an unprecedented third term. So, he kept his thoughts to himself. To buck American public opinion would destroy any dream of staying in the White House past 1940. And yet, the president, even as a young boy, had explored the world and read many books about other countries. The one he practically memorized was the Bible of American Naval Strategy. United States Navy Admiral Alfred Thayer Mayon's The Influence of Sea Power Upon History. From this, the president knew that, as war was coming, America's first line of defense was its sea power. But even then, it would be best for the United States if the war in general and America's defenses were engaged as far away from the eastern coast as possible. This idea, FDR softly yet consistently began to place into the minds of America's citizens through his speeches. But keeping the fight even further from American shores, FDR knew that helping Britain with its fight against Germany was best of all. After all, with Germany's bombers and panzers, war could come to America faster than any previous generation could imagine. At the very least, a defender's reaction time had been greatly reduced compared to World War I. With this in mind, Roosevelt told the people that it was only common sense to be mindful of the danger to which we in America must begin to be more alert. In getting back to what was best for America, the president knew that was to assist, in any way possible, Britain, since it was currently fighting Germany. And of the British, FDR's focus centered on Churchill. After all, the First Lord of the Admiralty was clearly a fighter. And as FDR worried about Japan's possible desire for the Philippines, getting to know Churchill, whose job it would be to protect British possessions in the Far East, would hopefully be the beginning of a united naval defense. With that in mind, one week after Germany invaded Poland, FDR wrote to Churchill, It is because you and I occupied similar positions in the World War that I want you to know how glad I am that you are back in the Admiralty. Now, a letter like this from a president to a cabinet member of a foreign power is unusual. But it was an FDR truism that he distrusted organizations, but rather relied on people. This would be his way all his professional life. The letter from FDR ended that he desired to develop a deep personal relationship with the First Lord of the Admiralty, and that he expected Churchill to not only continue fighting, but to do so with vigor. He would not be disappointed. In essence, the American was telling the British National to win the bloody war so America would not have to get involved. As for his part, the President pushed through a proposal that said, The Americas would not allow belligerents to fight within 300 miles of their respective coastlines. The normal territorial limit was three miles. But now that this would be the new norm, it obviously benefited the British, as goods would be coming to them from the Americas. Yet this very proposal, approved by an inter-American conference in late September of 1939, was itself an act just short of war. This was FDR keeping his part of the indirectly announced deal. Now it was Churchill and Britain's turn to uphold their end by winning the war. 
the two men would go on to exchange many communications. 788 from FDR and 1,161 from Churchill. The latter was obviously the more dependent member, hence the larger number. Back in September of 1938, as Neville Chamberlain, Mussolini, Hitler, and Francis de Ladier announced the Munich Agreement, FDR listened with skepticism. He doubted Hitler was done grabbing land. In reaction, FDR ordered the U.S. Navy to ready its 50 Great War Era destroyers for action. Having been anchored in the Philadelphia Naval Yard since after the Great War, the Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Harold R. Stark, wondered how he was going to comply with his boss's orders. The U.S. Navy at the time was undermanned, officers and crew alike, barely trained, had too few bases from which to operate from, and now were to be assigned to an Atlantic squadron, which would patrol the three-mile limit from the shoreline. Being a naval man himself, FDR knew of his Navy's limitations, so told the Naval Academy to speed up their graduation process. The men would have to learn on the job. But life was about to get even more stressful for Stark. When war came to Europe, Stark was invited to the White House. Harold Betty Stark, the Betty was his nickname since the Academy, was hand-in-hand with the President's thinking that Britain's victory would be the United States' victory. Stark told FDR, if Britain wins decisively against Germany, we could win everywhere. But if she loses, the problem confronting us would be very great. And while we might not lose everywhere, we might possibly not win anywhere. The President took this realistic assessment in stride, but then asked the Admiral to follow him to his map on a nearby wall. The Atlantic Squadron had been trying to patrol the now 300-mile limit agreed to by the Americas, but Stark knew they weren't doing a quality job. Yet now FDR drew a new set of lines, even further to the east, and asked Stark, could the Navy patrol this increased area? Stark replied in the negative, and gave a list of reasons why. FDR said no more. The Admiral assumed the conversation was over. It was not. Soon after, a State Department official found Stark and asked him what would it take to patrol the larger area described by the President. Stark somewhat tersely replied, it would take the Navy's entire 290-ship fleet, this included subs and auxiliary vessels, plus a tripling number of seaplanes. The Naval Chief also pointed out that this would leave the Pacific completely bare. The State Department official thanked him, and walked away. Again, Stark thought the conversation was over. Again, he was wrong. In October of that year, 39, Stark received a memo from the president that listed point by point the Navy's new orders. It would follow any suspicious craft of any nationality, remain in contact as long as possible, day or night, and on an open channel report the sighting, in plain English. The President's pencil lines on his map now became official policy. One reason for FDR's memo was Churchill's response to the President's first letter. Another reason was that the British had already started harassing German merchant vessels and passenger liners in the Atlantic and clearly needed the help. Right after Germany invaded Poland, The German passenger ship, the Columbus, left Havana. It had been caught unawares when the fighting actually started, and started for home. Yet British warships found her and chased her into a harbor off Veracruz, Mexico. Other German and Italian civilian ships were hounded into ports into the southern hemisphere and thus bottled up. The German crew of the Columbus would eventually paint the entire ship black, and head out at night with all of its lights off 
It was followed by the German freighter, the Araka. Yet the latter was found by the British, chased into American waters, and was forced to anchor in Florida's Port Everglades. There she sat, with her swastika flag flying high, an eyesore for Washington and the Floridians. As for the passenger liner Columbus, she had better luck at first. Sailing north well inside the U.S.'s declared line of non-aggression, American warships spotted the blackened vessel and followed her. They also called out her position in the clear every few hours. The American cruiser USS Tuscaloosa eventually dropped back, but by then a British warship had come along. The Germans were forced to heave to. Yet refusing to give up their top-of-the-line passenger ship, the German crew sabotaged her and got to their lifeboats. The Americans and British picked up the abandoned crew, and altogether they watched the Columbus sink. Obviously, word of this got out. The United States government told Nazi Germany that the American vessel had been on a routine neutrality patrol, that the Tuscaloosa had not even shown up until after the Columbus was already sinking. The Americans' cruiser captain and crew were ordered to remain silent about the details. When Poland was invaded, about 85 German and Italian vessels were within FDR's extended line of patrolling. Most were reported to the British, about half were forced to stay close to the shorelines of the Americas. The United States Navy had not fired a single shot, yet had helped the British tremendously in the opening months of the war in locating Axis shipping. But then came the short but sharp contest of the German heavy cruiser Graf Spee, already covered. Some of the South American nations screamed foul of the British violation of FDR's 300-mile neutrality zone. Yet Churchill, happy with the results, asked FDR to let the matter die down. Though the incidents of the Columbus and the Graf Spee were exactly what FDR and Churchill were aiming for, the British and the Americans weren't winning the war of the Atlantic. During the first four months of the war, the British had lost some 220 ships of all kinds. This led Churchill to ask the American president, in a secret message, of the possibility of the United States lending the older cruisers to the United Kingdom. Now, those that mattered in Berlin fully understood what Roosevelt was up to. Chief Admiral Reeder of the Kriegsmarine, or German Navy, angrily threatened, such procedure must be regarded as an act of war. But then, being more rational, he told Hitler that holding back his submarines only prolonged the war, and that only benefited Britain and America, which was true. But Hitler would not go along with his admiral's desire for all-out submarine warfare against the British and the supposed neutral Americans. For now, the industrial giant across the Atlantic was dormant, and Hitler needed it to stay that way, at least until Europe was his. Then, if the Americans came in, as they surely would in the course of time, it would be too late. In other words, let the Americans play their game. Yes, we will lose ships, but then we will have gained all of Europe. A fair trade to Hitler's thinking. The other reason for Hitler's policy was his low opinion of American readiness for war and its fighting prowess. As for the former, this was backed up by Germany's military and air attaché in Washington. They reported back to Berlin of the United States' lack of preparedness for war, and they weren't wrong. At this moment in time, the U.S. Army was smaller than Bulgaria's. No, the best America could do was supply the Allies with materiel. And even then, the president had before him his country's neutrality laws. Hitler had the time he needed to finish off his European enemies. As long as nothing happened to push the mostly content American public to support Roosevelt, 
the rest would transpire according to Hitler's plans. Hello everyone, Ray here. I'm going to explain Blue Apron to you the way my nine-year-old explains the Universal Remote to me. Blue Apron, the number one fresh ingredient and recipe delivery service in the country, wants to make your life easier. That simple. Please go to blueapron.com right now and check out their website. Just look around. You can pick from a variety of recipes and customize your delivery options, so you only get deliveries when you want them. Blue Apron ships them to your door. You open the box, follow these step-by-step instructions on the recipe cards, and within 40 minutes, you get a fresh, delicious, healthy meal that you made. Now, I've made several meals myself, and I'm no Julia Childs. But the family was pleased, surprisingly so, and that hurt a little bit. But for the rest of the evening, I'm a hero. One of my life's daily chores is now a delight. And a surprise, because I let Blue Apron pick the meals. I really have enjoyed the experience I've had so far, and I want you to try it. If I can get 20 of you, dear listeners, to try it, I want you to write to me and tell me of your experience. Really, I know you will be as satisfied as I was. So when you're on their website, remember to put in blueapron.com slash world war, check out this week's menu, and remember, with that slash world war, you get your first three meals free with free shipping. You will love how good it feels and tastes to create incredible home-cooked meals with Blue Apron. So don't wait. That's blueapron.com slash world war. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. On May 3rd, 1940, Hitler wrote of the United States to Mussolini, The reoccurring undertone of threats in Mr. Roosevelt's telegrams, notes, and inquiries is ample reason for seeing to it that the war is brought to an end as soon as possible. Il Duce was not of the same mind. He was thinking it would be best to attack France sometime in 1945. Not that it mattered what he thought. On May 10th, one week after Hitler wrote to Mussolini, Nazi Germany's panzers and bombers were unleashed on the West. 24 hours later, Chamberlain stepped down, as he had been unable to maintain peace in our time. Churchill was given the job, though many in his country and in the government believed he was still too reckless. But the decision had been made. On June 14th, Paris fell. Then came the miracle of Dunkirk in where some 338,000 British and French soldiers were shipped back to Britain, having escaped Hitler's panzers. And though Churchill supposedly slept soundly the first night of being made Prime Minister, his country's outlook was dismal. More than ever, he needed the new world to join the fight, to defend the old world. Yet that was the last thing on Roosevelt's mind. Back on May 16th, FDR spoke to a joint session of Congress. He warned his audience that Nazi Germany had the power to strike quickly, and it seemed overwhelmingly, that America's defenses could never be too strong. For example, he wanted enough American factories switched to war production to produce 50,000 planes a year. Congress, though some within still opposed the president, could not argue the news in the papers, so approved a fourfold increase in defense spending from $1.6 billion in 1940 to $6.4 billion for fiscal 1941. Just a few weeks later, while giving the commencement speech at the University of Virginia, FDR gave his most impassioned speech yet. Americans would not let their country become a lone island surrounded by the philosophy of force that the U.S. must use its material resources to help their fellow democracies, currently under attack. He finished with, We will not slow down or detour. Signs and signals call for speed. Full speed ahead. In today's words, this can be translated to, I feel the need, the need for speed. It was noticed by many that this speech was the President's strongest call for something other than neutrality. 
yet it seemed that FDR was the lone island. Systematic scientific polling on a regular basis had only started five years earlier, and the president kept up with the results. At the time of his speech at UVA, only 7% of Americans supported the idea of going to war against Germany. Yet that same percentage was willing to join the fight against Britain. Clearly, some Americans still harbored ill feelings about their former mother country. One third polled believed Germany would win, but two thirds felt strongly that the United States should stay out of Europe's problems. And now to the seedier side of international politics and war. At the time, the United States did not have a formal counter espionage organization. But now that France and the Low Countries were occupied by Germany, the President set out to fill this blatant gap in American intelligence. The Germans, like the British, needed certain raw materials brought in to keep their war production going, and Germany was getting much of what it needed from South America. Before now, the United States had paid little interest to its southern neighbors, except when exploiting them for those same resources. But now, it was of the first order that Britain wanted those supplies cut, and FDR was only too happy to assist. So, in May of 1940, Britain's intelligence service, MI6, sent over the Canadian businessman, William Stevenson. To the outside world, his job was a passport control officer. Stevenson quickly made contact with the White House, to wit, FDR ordered FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover personally to work with the British spy and help him in any way he could. That this broke the recently passed Foreign Espionage Act mattered not a jot to the President. Anything short of war he would undertake to keep the Sons of America out of the conflict. Stevenson got right to work. As FDR would be running for an unprecedented third term, the British Security Coordination, or BSC, supported those candidates that were running against isolationist candidates. They weren't as successful as they'd hoped, but it's hard to judge their true effect. Getting back to the trade between Germany and South America, the BSC and other American agencies did what they could to disrupt the flow and the trust between the two continents. By the summer of 1940, Walter Funk, the German economics minister, was heard to say, either we will trade directly with the sovereign South American states, or we won't trade at all. It seems the British and American spies were having a fair amount of success here. Yet Stevenson's BSC's greatest success to date came about when the spy agency forged German documents and gave them to Hoover. The supposed official letters authorized a fascist plot to take over the government in Bolivia. Hoover ran them over to the White House. Now, no matter how one feels about Roosevelt generally, he should be credited with enough intelligence to question what he was shown. Yet, as it served his interest in causing tension between Germany and South America, he personally forwarded to the Bolivian government. Not unexpectedly, the government there ordered the entire German embassy staff to leave the country. Furthermore, some 150 Nazi sympathizers were arrested. Some of them were placed before firing squads. The BSC then leaked the episode to the American press. By the time the readers got hold of this, the majority may still have wanted to stay out of the war, but more and more they came to fear and hate Nazi Germany. What's more, the threat of fascist fifth columnists seemed very real. Who could the average American trust anymore? As the paranoia grew, FDR used this to kick out all the Italian and German representatives in the country. Drip by drip, the president was bringing the American people to his side. Yet, would it be enough to get the American public to support him as he tried to change the neutrality laws. FDR was determined to keep the fighting as far from American shores as possible, and his best bet still remained 
helping Britain win. What a beautiful day in nature. Take it from a little bug like me. Nothing makes you feel more alive. <laughs> whoa, whoa. <laughs> I almost got frogged. That was a close call. But boy, do I feel capital A alive. Luckily for you humans, Nature's Way put that thrilling feeling of aliveness in a bottle. Nature's Way Alive Women's Multivitamin Gummies with 16 vitamins and minerals. Delicious multivitamins inspired by nature. <laughs> whoa. Better luck next time, pal. Nature's Way.